I want you to imagine you're living in Alaska, you're a psychiatrist working in this small town, and you start to notice a pattern occurring in these sessions with your patients. They all have this reoccurring dream about an owl, and eventually it gets to the point where your patients are completely losing their grasp on reality because they are convinced that this is something else. This is the premise of the fourth kind. Now I do have a pretty personal connection to this movie. I remember when it first came out, my older sister and my parents decided to watch it without me, saying that I was too little to watch it. And maybe they were kind of saving me because for the next couple of nights they would have reoccurring nightmares about the film and wouldn't be able to sleep. And it's pretty safe to say that it ruined their sleep schedule for a pretty long time. And after digging a little bit more into it, there was something about this movie that really struck a chord with people, completely ruining not only my parents' sleep schedules but others as well, and forcing them to completely forget about the movie just so they could sleep at night. And so today we're going to take a dive into this long forgotten film that made so many people question their own sanity. There's two people or two subjects that are in your backyard? Correct, and they're very large. They're like okay. foot. Nine feet, ten foot, I don't know, they're, they, look like, they look like aliens to us. Now, aliens have always been a pretty hot topic of discussions, with the whole UFO sightings confirmed to be real, and the most recent discovery of the alien corpse in Mexico. But 2009 was a very different time, and without TikTok humor, people were very much more afraid of aliens than they are now. And with the release of movies like The Blair Witch Project, which popularized the found footage genre, a big heavy hitter soon followed. It was the release of Paranormal Activity. <laughs> which really changed the game at the time of what people found terrifying. And in comes the fourth kind. Now there was something very different about the fourth kind. This is majorly credited to the fact that the movie starts off by telling you that this entire movie is a reenactment of events that took place on October 1st, 2000 in a northern town in Alaska. And throughout the entire movie, clips of the actual incidents are shown in the film. And all of these were recorded by a psychiatrist called Dr. Abigail Miller. And although this entire movie was a work of fiction, at the time a lot of people were convinced that this movie was in fact very real. Which only added to the disturbing recordings that are shown in the movie. <laughs> But before we begin, please don't forget to subscribe to the channel as well as liking the video and commenting bruh. Also, we do have a special guest uh, he's sitting on my couch. It's me from the future. As you can see, I've aged very poorly. I'm over here stroking. But yeah, happy Halloween or happy Halloween almost, depending on when this comes out. And also be sure to be prepared because what we're going to be diving into today is very disturbing. The movie starts out with this extremely chilling introduction that establishes everything you need to know, including what I mentioned earlier that this is a reenactment. People's names were changed for privacy reasons, and it even says that what you choose to believe is real is entirely up to you to decide, as well as a warning that the footage that's included in this film is extremely disturbing. And what follows is Dr. Campos as well as Abigail, who is the film's protagonist, Dr. Campos being her psychiatrist. And during this session, we soon find out that Abigail is trying to relive the murder of her husband, Will, doing this through some hypnosis that Dr. Campos is performing on her. And hypnosis is going to be a reoccurring theme throughout this entire movie so be sure to keep this in mind. Although while she's reliving this it turns out to be extremely painful and Dr. Campos is forced to take her out. And when she's out of the hypnosis she tells Dr. Campos that Will was killed during one of their studies which we'll later find out is the investigation of the reoccurring nightmares happening to people of Gnome. Which we'll dig into a little bit later. And two months after Abigail's husband is killed she's back to work in Alaska. Also, something that's pretty unnerving is that the town is called Nome, and what's even creepier is that the only way to access this town is by plane, making this place a pretty rural, inaccessible town. Once Abigail's back in town, she resumes her therapy sessions with her patients, and this first patient she's going to be seeing is a man named Tyler. Tyler tells her that he's having difficulty sleeping, and he's waking up every night at 3 a.m., and when she prompts him if anything in particular is waking him up, he says that an owl has been staring at him from outside of his window. And it's here where it switches to two other patients, all three giving the exact same answers as did Tyler. The owl never flies away, saying it just stares, and on top of that, they say that they've been seeing this owl since they were a kid, saying that it's been this reoccurring thing throughout their entire lives, although the owl only appears once every, say, five years, but now it's appearing at least once a week. Some of the patients have even said that the owl has made its way inside of their home, 
and has stared at them from the foot of their bed. And Abigail, obviously very much overwhelmed by all of these similarities in her patients, she decides to conclude all of these sessions. After this, she goes to pick up her daughter Ashley, who from a result of conversion disorder, caused her to go blind. And a quick medical lesson, conversion disorder, also known as functional neurological system disorder, is a condition in which a person experiences physical and sensory problems, such as paralysis, numbness, blindness, deafness, or seizures, with no underlying neurologic pathology. And some reasons that can cause this disorder is often a traumatic event, adverse life event, or acute slash chronic stressor preceding symptoms of conversion disorder. And in this case for Ashley, it was triggered by the death of her father. When we go back home, the family settles in for dinner, but Abigail's son has a different plan and starts antagonizing his mom, saying things like she can't accept his death and that she's too busy helping others to help herself heal from this grieving. He also brings up that they haven't even discussed how how his father died, which is pretty interesting considering Abigail is still having trouble even remembering the situation. After dinner, Abigail retreats to her room to listen to some audio files that her husband Will left her. And Will was also a psychiatrist who worked alongside Abigail, and that it's not just these three patients that are suffering from sleep disorder in Nome, but rather it's 300 of the population, all experiencing this sleep disorder and reporting sightings of this owl. The next day, Abigail resumes her work with a patient named Tom who after putting him under using hypnosis, begins to recount what happened to him last night. It's then where Tommy begins to completely freak out and panics, saying that something is coming inside of his home. And after Abigail brings him back, he denies the entire episode and denies to even say what he was seeing when he was under hypnosis, keeping what he saw a secret from Abigail, which will turn into something far more darker as the film progresses. After the session, things begin to shift gears and we're shown the original 911 call dispatchers received from Tommy's wife later that night. It said that Tommy is holding his wife and kids hostage at gunpoint and Tommy is demanding that Abigail come immediately or he's going to his entire family. When Abigail makes it to the scene, she's able to get Tommy on the phone, and he begins telling her that he doesn't have a choice, saying this as he holds a gun to his wife's head. However, things quickly spiral as Tommy tells Abigail that if she saw what he saw, she would understand. Tommy evidently very traumatized from the hypnosis that Abigail put him through, forcing him to relive memories that were suppressed. And so tragically, he ends his entire family and ends himself as well. And after this all goes down, Abigail is taken to the police station for questioning as she was the last person to see Tommy before this all went down. And essentially what happens here is that the sheriff believes that if it weren't for Abigail hypnotizing him, none of this would have happened. But Abigail's saying that these memories would have come back eventually. It's also mentioned how Abigail's murderer was never caught, but Sheriff August believes that it was a not alive and has filed it as such. It also, it's pretty much established that these two characters hate each other. And the following day, Abigail goes back to work, almost as if nothing happened, and continues her session with Tyler. But this time he's joined by his wife, and they tell Abigail that he wants to be put under to see if there was any memories inside of his head that could potentially lead him down the same path as Tommy. And their reasoning for this is because Tyler suffered from the same symptoms as Tommy, they both saw the owl, and they both had issues sleeping at night. But Abigail is pretty hesitant at this because the last time she put someone under, they ended up doing all of this. So as a precaution, she has her own psychiatrist, Dr. Campos, sit in on the session. Once under, Tyler still recounts seeing the owl, and unlike Tommy, he is able to describe what it looks like. But soon the owl disappears, and Tyler begins to having a similar, if not identical, episode as did Tommy claiming that there is someone at his door and he begins to panic, which results in this incredibly disturbing segment where Tyler is choking on his own saliva and appears to be having a seizure. But luckily, Abigail is able to take him out of this trance. And upon a reflection, Tyler admits that none of what he saw made any sense, saying that he saw, quote, them, 
and they're not from here. He begins describing anything he can, saying they smelled like a putrid cinnamon, and that they talk inside of your mind like they're connected. Quote, they take me away and I don't know what they do to me. Tyler even admitting that, quote, now I know why he did it. You have to have seen it, felt it, it's the worst thing you could ever imagine. And it's also here where Abigail begins to suspect that something else is at play here, potentially an artificial life form, and believes that what could be happening are abductions. But before she can expand on this idea, her assistant comes in saying she needs to listen to this tape. And what is revealed to be on this tip is a recording of Abigail doing her nightly check-ins regarding the cases. But she falls asleep while doing so, and what is recorded is what happened after Abigail fell asleep. And honestly, what happens after Abigail falls asleep freaked me out really bad because we hear a door creaking opened, and what follows is one of the most terrifying screams I've ever heard. Also, hopefully I'm able to keep this clip in. If not, I'm sorry, because that means this video got demonetized because of it. And on hearing these screams, Abigail denies that that's even her. But in a later interview, she says that when she first heard this, she was in complete denial. And when she got home later that night, she tried to recount the events that made her scream in the recording. She had been sleeping in her bed when her door opened and something came into her home, even leaving behind this scar on her body, saying during the encounter she had fought back against this unknown figure, but ultimately it was too strong and took her away. She also found scratches left behind on her floorboards, which were from when she was being taken. But it's here where we get this very strange bit, because on trying to figure out what happened, there's also this foreign language that is playing during the recording that Abigail is unable to figure out. And so she calls an author of a book on dead Latin. And during the call, they end up figuring out that Abigail's husband was in contact with this author as well. The author says that Will was trying to get a lesson on ancient languages to try and figure out what these recordings were saying. And the author, on his own record, decides to fly out to Nome because he too is under suspicion that there is something else going on. Dr. Awaloa also determines that the voices heard in the recordings were speaking a language that predates the Egyptian hieroglyphics, also known as the oldest language in human history. But what's strange is that the vocals do not sound human. Dr. Willow also goes into a history lesson that explains that this could be aliens, although this is a lot of stuff that I'm sure you guys don't want summarized, it's a little bit boring, but a lot of it is backing that this in fact may be aliens. Although Dr. Campos, who is also with Dr. Olawoa and Abigail, is saying that this is ludicrous. But as they're discussing this, Abigail gets a phone call from Tyler's wife, who tells Abigail that Tyler has been in an extremely bad state after the hypnosis from the other day. And the creepiest part of this is that Tyler has the same kind of marking that Abigail found on her own body, and after some persuasion, because Tyler is very much against going under another hypnosis, Abigail is able to convince him to do so. Her reasoning for this is to try and see what's going on inside of his mind. And we do also get some original footage from that night. Will jolts up out of bed and his body begins to float off of the ground, his face completely disfigured. And after this it just cuts out and Abigail is seen rushing home out of fear that this is going to be pinned on her as well. She also says that she plans on skipping town completely, but she's too late and the sheriff comes to her home to arrest her, saying that Scott was completely paralyzed from the neck down as a result of whatever happened, saying three of his vertebrae were severed as a result of the hypnosis. But luckily, Dr. Campos is at Abigail's house and vouches for her, saying that it wasn't her fault and that he was there. So luckily, she isn't sent to jail, although she is put under house arrest and is under 24-hour surveillance. And after all of this, it cuts to a segment of Abigail after all of these events went down. She explains that these disappearances have been happening in Nome since the early 1960s. Also during her interview, she begins to explain the four kinds of encounters you can have with an alien, saying the first kind is when you see a UFO, the second is when you see evidence of it, so crop circles or radiation, the third kind is when you make contact, but the fourth kind, she says, there's nothing more frightening than the fourth kind. 
because that is when they abduct you. Abigail then comes to the revelation that everything she's been seeing, the owl, the patients behaving erratically, is all connected to the abductions. She even claims that Gnome isn't the only place where this is happening, and that after the abductions, those who were abducted are forced to forget, which is why the hypnosis is awaking the memories of those who were abducted, these memories being suppressed by whatever is taking them. Now all of this of course is from her perspective, and as stated at the beginning, it is for you to decide what you believe. Back at Abigail's house, an officer spots something floating over her home, claiming that something is pulling them out of the house. But the footage is completely distorted, unfortunately. Upon hearing this, the sheriff rushes over to the house, Abigail claiming that her child is missing, that a beam of light came in and took her from the sky. But obviously the sheriff is extremely skeptical of this because at this point he's convinced that she has lost her grip on reality, and he believes that Abigail is responsible for her missing daughter. It's honestly an extremely well done scene because it forces you, the viewer, to pick a side. Essentially, who do you believe? Do you believe Abigail or the sheriff? Both having these valid perspectives, enforcing their beliefs. For example, all the sheriff has been seeing this entire time is that people are dying and going missing, not to mention losing their minds, and it all links back to Abigail, or at least that's what it seems like from his end. Because from his point of view, she seems to be the problem, and now her daughter is mysteriously missing, and she's the only one that was even in the house. And so the sheriff ends up blaming Abigail for her missing daughter and takes her son as a result. And so with the only thing she can think of doing, she calls Dr. Campos and asks him to put her under hypnosis. Once she's under, she says that she saw the owl and that it's smiling. Quote, it's not an owl. And it's here where we finally get to see what happened that night. Something comes into Abigail's room and takes her by the legs. She's taken into this white room and is injected by a needle into her back. And we can see while Abigail's experiencing these memories, she's also having a seizure. And the following was transcribed from the footage. Give me my baby, give her back to me. Abigail pleading for her child to be returned, but it says, Child never returned. My I am. Truth remains. I savior. Father, I am God. And this final line really sent a chill down my spine. I mean, it's pretty creepy. Abigail saying that after her hypnosis, her, Dr. Campos, and Dr. Awoloa were all abducted that night and returned, but even with hypnosis, they were all unable to recall what they did to them. Those three chilling words floating in the air, Abigail even claiming that this may not be God, but it may be pretending to be. After the hypnosis, Abigail was subsequently sent to the hospital for her injuries after the alien possession, to which the sheriff pays her a visit and asks her the thing he's been asking the entire movie, what happened to her husband, Will. And at this point in the movie, it's pretty much been established that Will was stabbed throughout the night, and this was presumably by an alien. But the sheriff pulls out this image of Will after he was killed, saying that he wasn't murdered, rather he was unalived. And in the image we can see the wound on Will's head, and the gun that he used. But Abigail is very much in denial at this, saying that she's a psychiatrist and she would have known the signs that he was at risk. But honestly, the evidence is irrefutable, and what's even creepier is that Abigail brings up the fact that the three of them were abducted that night, but Dr. Campos is sitting right next to them when she says this and denies that claim completely. Dr. Campos saying that she is wrong and that after she had her seizure, they went straight to the hospital. And so on hearing this, the sheriff begins to hammer down on Abigail and asks her where her daughter is. Because at this point, he's extremely fed up and is convinced that she's lost her grip on reality. And he's pretty much certain that Abigail is the one who caused her daughter to go missing. We come back to the interview of Abigail, and she's claiming that she's now come to terms with the fact that her husband unalived himself. However, everything else, she continues to back up as reality, saying because the recordings are there, her back was broken as a result of her possession, and her daughter is still missing to this day. It's pretty hard to watch as Abigail breaks down crying, saying that all of this was real, 
although by many she's been labeled as insane. But there is one thing keeping her going, she's still holding on to hope that one day she'll get to see her daughter again. The movie ends stating that Abigail wasn't the only one interested in investigating these strange happenings going on at Nome. Since the 1960s, there have been 3,000 visits to Nome by the FBI. Ending off with the statement that was given at the very beginning, in the end, what you believe is yours to decide. <sighs> so this movie is a lot to unpack and really gets you to question who was right. And I do really want to talk about that ending sequence because at the very end we get the revelation that that Will was never killed, rather he ended himself. Which does throw all of Abigail's claims into question, especially considering that even Dr. Campos at the end can't even back her up. And it begs the question that if Abigail was ever even abducted, or was this all a result of the trauma she underwent? She even states herself that seeing her husband killed was her own mind trying to resolve this traumatic event. So could this entire movie be a fiction created by Abigail's own mind? In reality, she was simply a psychologist who perhaps was creating patterns in her patients on her own accord. Patterns that may not even have been there. Perhaps she did create this entire conspiracy to try and distract herself from the truth. I especially want to note the disappearance of her daughter at the end of the movie because it makes you wonder if Abigail was to blame, how could she have done it? Because there was an officer right outside of her home monitoring her 24-7. And if she did put her somewhere inside of the house, officers would have found her as they searched the house shortly after this. But at the end of the movie, it states that Ashley was never found. So it is truly up to you to decide who has more evidence to convince you. Do you believe Abigail and her accounts of an alien life form taking her patients, herself, and eventually her daughter? Or do you take the side of the sheriff, Abigail suffering from her own trauma and unable to distinguish reality from fiction? But yeah, feel free to let me know what you think because I'd love to hear it. Also, I really hope you enjoyed this one because I have been meaning to branch into movies alongside my other stuff. And yeah, hopefully you liked it. Also, a huge thank you to my ultimate tiers, Alejandra from The Tower, 1998, and K-pop lover X3. Thank you so much. And yeah, if you do want to support me, it's only $1.99 and you also get early access to videos, so that's cool. Cool. But yeah, thank you so much for spending some time with me. Happy Halloween. I'll see you later. Bye.